Hello, and thank you for joining us today. The, I am Cindy Hall with the Iowa Agriculture Literacy Foundation, and we're very excited to have students from across Iowa um, join us for this special farm chat from Norman Borlaug's Boyhood Home um, near Cresco. So this, this program is a joint program between three organizations that are very passionate about teaching students about agriculture and as it relates to Iowa history. So the Silos and Smokestacks National Heritage Area is involved, um, myself with the Iowa Agriculture Literacy Foundation, and then the Norman Borlaug Heritage Foundation. Um, and I will introduce representatives of each of those organizations that are partners with me on this program today in just a second. First, I wanna explain where, you're, where we're at today. Um, we are, so uh, you're, we're going to spend most of the time um, looking at the farm in the house of Norman Borlaug, and, um, and we'll lear learn about the schoolhouse that's on the property as well. Mm -hmm. And it is um, located in Creston, Iowa, which is in Howard County, up in the very northeast corner of the state, not too far from the Minnesota border. So you can see on this map um, and try to find where you're at, where you're at with your school. I know we have several um, classes joining from Northeast Iowa. I know there's some Osage students, shout out to you. Um, this program will last, it will be done by two o'clock. Um, and uh, I encourage teachers to introduce where you're from, where you're watching from in the comments, just put your, your grade level and, um, and where you're watching from in the comments. And then also encourage your students to ask questions. And you as a teacher, if you can type their questions into the comments um, box, that would be great. We're gonna take uh, several of those questions live um, and address those during our live broadcast. But the ones that we don't get to, um, we're going to post uh, the answers to those mm -hmm. questions um, after the broadcast is over. So with that, I'm gonna introduce our other partners. Um, so we have, um, we have with us today, um, Tom Spindler with the, um, the Norman Borlaug Heritage Foundation, and also Laura Elfers. Um, Laura is with, um, with Silos and Smokestacks National Heritage Area. Now you won't see, um, you won't see Laura today because uh, she's behind the camera. She's our camera person today, um, but, uh, but you might hear her voice a little bit um, asking questions or as we communicate about what we wanna show you throughout the broadcast based on your questions. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Tom and Tom is gonna tell us a little bit about Norman Borlaug, who he was and why he's very important. So Tom, can you tell us a little bit about Norman and why um, students should know about him? Sure. Well, thanks and, and welcome to all the students across the state of Iowa or anywhere that are viewing this program. So I'm part of the Norman Borlaug Heritage Foundation and uh, I help out on the farms and, and give tours of the farms. But uh, Norman Borlaug was born on this date, March 25th, 107 years ago. Uh, he grew up in, in a, uh, on a farm that's very uh, uh, poor. Uh, it was back in the days of where they farmed with horses and everyone had to work very hard just to get by and sustain what they needed to have on the farm. Um, he went on to uh, great things, of course, and he's a real hero of mine. But uh, on this farm, after his hard work uh, and going, also going to the one room schoolhouse that's, that was about a mile away from here, he was lucky enough to go on to high school and then uh, on to college in a time when uh, boys in, on the farms in those days in the 1920s and early 30s, they usually stayed at home. But he was able, because of his parents, uh, he was able to go on to the University of Minnesota, got his uh, degree in plant pathology, which is working with plants and every, understanding everything that uh, is made up of plants. And then he went to work uh, for the Rockefeller Foundation to help the Mexican government in Mexico in the 40s and the 50s. And he worked with crossbreeding of wheat uh, in the wheat fields in Mexico to try to help uh, the Mexican people, the farmers, uh, and the government to help feed their people. They weren't feeding themselves uh, with enough grain. And so through his work, through about a 15 year period of working with other scientists uh, and helpers there in Mexico, he had changed and transformed what was grown in Mexico with wheat. 
It went from a country that could not grow enough food for their own people to where they were able to grow enough for themselves, but also to export it out to other countries too. Uh, his, his crossbreeding techniques made it so that the, they were able to grow about three to four times as much wheat as they had ever grown before. And it was unheard of. And he had some amazing uh, scientific innovations. So this scientist from uh, little Northeast Iowa in Cresco was making a big, big difference. Of course, after he had the success with the wheat, uh, this wheat that he developed was able to grow anywhere in the world. And so he saw in Indian Pakistan that in those countries, they were expecting mass starvations in the 1960s because they were in the same boat. They were not able to grow enough food for their own people. And so he offered to the government and to the scientists and the small stakes farmers there in India and Pakistan, he says, we will give you the seed, plant our seed that we've grown here in Mexico. It will grow in your countries too. If you do that, you can keep from having your people starve to death. And within a three year period after that happened, uh, that's exactly what happened. They were able to feed all of those masses of people in those countries. Uh, because of that, uh, his humanitarian work of bring, bringing food to a starving world, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize, the highest award that you could be given as a uh, citizen of this world. He then went on to work in, in uh, China and in Indonesia and in South America and Africa the rest of his life. And of course, uh, you know, along with this hard work, as he worked until his dying days in 2009 is when he died, he worked until his dying days at the ripe age of 95, trying to help uh, all countries to grow enough food for their, their people, uh, wherever it happened to be. He won the Nobel Peace Prize, of course, back in 1970. He received the uh, um, Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Ford in 1977. And then of course the Congressional Gold Medal that is the highest civilian award given to anyone um, for remarkable things. And he received that in 2007. There's the picture of, um, of President Bush uh, awarding him and giving it uh, the, um, uh, in the Capitol building. Uh, you also see uh, one other thing that happened after he died, five years later, there was uh, a commission of uh, the Iowa legislature that passed a resolution that said, this man has done so much for Iowa, so much for the world that we need to have his statue uh, as part of the statuary hall in Washington, DC in our nation's capital. And so there you see that picture too. So uh, that's who Norman Borlaug was. I mean, here, here was a, a boy that grew up on this farm, not very far from all of you, in the state of Iowa, near Cresco, Iowa, um, and look what he did. So pretty amazing. Um, Tom, I we switched the camera view so the students can see the farm now. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the meaning of these statues here on the farm? Ah, uh, so uh, if you remember my uh, what I was telling you about the uh, uh, what he did for the world, we had a. Uh, um, a sculptor that was uh, Dr. William Fowler from Wisconsin, uh, heard about what Norman had done, read about him, and then he was so taken with him that he came to us and actually said he would like to do a couple statues in honor of Norman Borlaug. And he says, I've got this idea. I want to have uh, two statues. He says, I want to show Norman as a young boy um, feeding his chickens on the farm. And there's the chicken coop that, that was there when he was a boy growing up. And so there is young Norman, probably about 10 years of age with his bucket and he's giving uh, some corn and seed to those chickens. And he says, the other statue I wanna have is showing him uh, what he did in the world. And so this is uh, as it pans back to the uh, world statue, you'll see him in a wheat field, there's wheat around him. And then there's these boys, these are the bird boys uh, that helped shoo, shoo away the birds away from uh, the, the wheat so it wouldn't, they wouldn't eat the, uh, the seed. And he's showing them what he's doing. And then of course, the rest of the continents, so there he is in Mexico, and in the rest of the continents of the world, there are people there that have wheat in front of them and they're all huddling around and reaching out toward Norman in Mexico because those were all the different continents of Indian, uh, you know, including India and Pakistan, uh, Africa, South America, 
who all benefited from his, his work. This man, this, all the wheat seeds that he developed in Mexico over that 15 year period would then become what we would eat uh, in, in our breads and our pancakes and everything. Uh, all the de descendant seeds from what he did in Mexico and around the world is what we came to know and what, to, what we used to, for our food for generations. And so that's quite a, quite a uh, honor to have these two statues on our farm site, which is near the, the house, as you see. Great. Well, speaking of the farm, um, Laura, can you show us a little bit around the farm? And Tom, will you tell us about it? Yeah, I'll just oh, narrate we'll as she kind of goes around. So there's the chicken coop that uh, he would have collected eggs along with his sisters. He had two sisters, uh, Charlotte and Palma, that would uh, go out there and collect those eggs. Also had to clean the, the uh, chicken coop. There's a shed that would keep the machinery in there from uh, the spring to, to the, the plow to, um, oh, we lose that. We'll, we'll bring it back on. Okay, and then you have the, is that on there, Cindy? Okay. Yep, yep. thanks. And, and there's the uh, granary corn crib where they would actually store corn in there. And there are also the grain that would be used to feed hogs or uh, the chickens. Uh, the big barn, which you'll see next, uh, which was built in 1929. And Norm helped to build that with his family uh, and his dad, Henry back when he was probably about 14 or 15. And uh, that's where, that would house all the main animals. There was also a hog house that was in between there. Oh, there's a good picture of it. The fields that you see uh, to the left of that, that would have been some of the fields that Norm would have uh, farmed. Uh, he would have been out there with his workhorses. Uh, that's a little pump house there. And just next to that pump house, that tree, there would have been a, um, windmill there. That's where they pumped the water out. It went into this pump house where they had a cistern in there and it would cool. Uh, this water would run into this cement uh, container and then out into the, uh, the livestock uh, yard for the animals. But those, that is where they would store the milk in these, this cold running water. So out in those fields is where Norm would have been farming these uh, with his horses. They had three workhorses. Uh, two of them would go out and pull the plow or the, the drag or the, the planter or whatever was uh, being used at the time of the season, uh, while one of the horses would rest in that, that uh, barn for the day. And so they would uh, rotate those horses so that all the horses could then get a break every third day. And his favorite horse, of course, was his buddy Bob. And that, was, that horse grew up with uh, Norm and they were born on exactly the same day, which was 107 years ago today. Very good. Um, well, how about we head into the house and take a look at, um, at where Norman and his family lived? All right. So this is uh, what you're looking at here is the Sears house. Uh, I call it a Sears house because the family, when they decided to buy this property um, and to build a house on it, uh, in those days, you didn't uh, go to a local contractor to come up with an idea to build a house. Uh, they would order it through a catalog, much like you kids, uh, if you're going online uh, to amazon.com to order something, it was very much the same way. They'd send these big, thick catalogs to you, and then you could look through it and you could get anything from uh, clothing to kitchen appliances, but you could also order a house. And so this house came um, to, on the railroad. It was uh, just with all of its, uh, uh, the shingles and the, the, the doors, the windows, the flooring, everything except for the plaster for the walls. And it was uh, about $1,000 from what we understand is what it cost this family to build this thing. And so here you have, uh, Laura's showing us the insides of it's basically two large rooms. Uh, this is the living room. Uh, and then uh, we'll show the kitchen here in a second. So it was just a six room house, two large rooms downstairs, and she's going into the kitchen now, and uh, four bedrooms upstairs. And so in the kitchen, for example, she's uh, panning into some of the things that might have been in that house at that time. The stove was the main central piece there because you had to have a heating source. And back in 1922, there was no uh, you know, central uh, heating source. And so you had to use the heat from the, the wood burning stove, or they would also burn 
uh, coal in there also. And then uh, they would cook with that, but also that was their source of heating water uh, if they're gonna take a bath. Like in this kitchen, there'd be a big tub in there and then the kids would be taking their Saturday night baths uh, once a week, if that was always the thing. And when you took a bath in there, the little kids, it went first and then the older siblings, the other brothers or sisters would do it last. So you would get to use the same bath water as, those, uh, as your siblings. So there's a, there's a pump, uh, they had a cistern in the basement. I, if you kids don't understand what a cistern is, uh, your, your teachers can maybe tell you later on or you can look it up, but there was a great big concrete cement uh, square uh, pyramid shaped in the basement in which it would collect rainwater, the water would run down into the basement, it would stay in there and then they could pump this out and so that they could get water to uh, bathe with or to uh, do their laundry with or whatever it happened to be. What else do we have, Laura? Just keep panning around there. There's the upstairs that went up to the four bedrooms that were very tiny, there was no closets, uh, there was no bathroom up there. You gotta realize no indoor, plumbing, so you had to uh, go outside to the outhouse to go potty. And there's the outhouse in the, over there by that big tree. Not a very nice place to go when it's 10 below zero in the middle of winter, that's for sure. There's a, a telephone that they would have had back in those days. Uh, and then, of course, some of those are very simple things that uh, every uh, um, farm family had. And then, Laura, you can go back into the other room and this is, uh, it had two doors going in. So there's the living room and then to the right where Laura was just uh, showing, that's the dining room. And that shows some of the, the uh, items that were in the Borlaug family. There's a sewing machine, of course, um, and their dining area. Um, and uh, there was a nice hutch that was given to uh, Norm's parents on their uh, wedding day. Okay, let's go back in the other room there, Laura. And uh, maybe let's, yeah, let's look at the parents. So think about uh, Norman in 1922. So this 99 years ago, they moved into this house. And uh, this was after several years of living at, their, at his grandparents' house before they bought this house and built it. There's Henry and Clara on the left. Henry and Clara's parents. And uh, you notice there's two sets of couples. So that's Clara's sister. Inga, that also got married on that same day. So it was a double wedding, quite the deal. So Henry and um, Clara, and then uh, the three children. Norm was the oldest, and then we had um, uh, Palma, who was next in age, and then, um, well, let's go to the, let's see. I don't know if you can go to the other picture here just for a second. Uh, it was Palma and Charlotte. And then here's, um, this is Nels and Emma. This is his grandparents in which they lived in the house at the other farm site that we have on the, the properties. And these two farms kind of connect. This is, these are the two people that he would live with until uh, they moved into this house in 1922. All right. Um, Tom, if you'd like, I can show them the pictures of, yeah. oh, do you want to look at the other pictures first on the piano and then uh, we'll... No, we That's can, okay. you know, in the interest of time, we probably should probably get going, but go ahead and show um, those pictures that you had there. Cindy. Sure. We're going to show you some pictures um, of Norman and his wife, as well as some of the other family members. Okay. Now you should be able to... There, there, there. There we go. So the bottom picture shows Henry and Clara. And then, uh, you know, by then, this is Norm is probably about graduation age, or maybe he's even gone off to college. I'm not sure. Palma is on the left, and then uh, Charlotte on the right with the plaid dress on, and then Henry and Clara. And they would live in this house, uh, you know, until well, well after Norm was graduated in 1932. Um, and so uh, Charlotte would be a, a a uh, housewife uh, in uh, Cresco, outside of Cresco, and would uh, do some teaching too. And she was always so proud of Norm. Charlotte would come out and talk to our kids at our Inspire Days and tell stories about how improved or uh, uh, how much they uh, admired what uh, Norm had done. And 
she said he had this fascination about plants all through his childhood and really loved trees more than anything else. And that's his wife, uh, Margaret, that's on their wedding day, I believe, uh, that he, he met her at the University of Minnesota uh, in the early 1930s. Tom, can you tell us a little bit about um, where Norm and his siblings would have went to school and what school was like for students at that okay, time? Okay, well, uh, you know, maybe, and you can show that picture. Also on our property that we have uh, is the one-room schoolhouse that Norm would have gone to school in. It was not on this property. It was actually moved there back in about 1990. But uh, at that time, um, uh, when, this, when he went to school in 19, 1920, uh, this school was already over 50 years old. This school was built in 1865. And a few students, this is Iowa History Month. And of course, history is a big part of our country. Well, in 1865, Abraham Lincoln had just been assassinated. The Civil War had just ended. And now here are these men out there building this one-room schoolhouse uh, and probably talking about Abraham Lincoln's assassination. But 50 years later, 55 years later, is when Norm would go to school here and would spend eight years. Now, a one-room schoolhouse, there was 13,000 of these schools uh, dotted across uh, the landscape of Iowa uh, in the late 1800s. And so uh, they were very much uh, uh, a big part of Iowa's education in the early days. And of course, it went through eighth grade. So you, you students that are watching this, you might be in the same, uh, if you were going to school here, you might have your brothers and sisters that maybe you're in first grade or maybe they're in eighth grade and you're in fifth grade. There's a picture of the inside of the school. It's, or, we've made some different changes, but uh, we're getting more and more things done to it. We've got a, a, a wood burning stove in it now. So it's a, quite a bit changed from that. But Norm would have gone through eight years here. But uh, then it was uh, time for him, as most boys, to go back and work on the farm uh, to help his dad. He's the only boy. That's a lot of labor intensive work to be, do, be doing out on the farm. And so uh, most boys would do that. However, his teacher, Sina, uh, who was his uh, cousin, went to, the, to Henry and Clara and said, listen, as a as a uh, as a scholar, he's no great shakes, but he's got a lot of determination. And so he should go on to high school and they felt education was important. And so they did send him there. And we're so thankful that he was able to go on to high school where he, he wrestled, uh, played football, uh, finished, uh, I think it was third in the state tournament of wrestling. So, you know, he was, he was a, a little bit of everything, but really worked hard. There is a picture of uh, his hat that was in the wheat fields that he wore in the wheat fields uh, that was given to us uh, along with this pair of boots that um, uh, that his daughter uh, Jeannie sent to us uh, because of uh, after he died she was uh, cleaning up some things and she thought we would probably appreciate that we have a uh, Cindy, should we probably take some uh, questions? Yeah, 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 let's take some some questions. So one question that we already had typed in was how long um, did Norm and his family live in the house? Well, uh, Norm left for college in 1932. He would come back uh, in summers uh, and uh, and help Henry at times. But uh, so he was gone by 1932. He They moved into that house in 1922. So about 10 years for Norm. Of course, the sisters lived there longer, and then Henry and Clara lived in there into the into the 1960s until they got to uh, where they needed to go to a, a nursing home in Cresco. Yep. Another question we have um, from Mrs. Bell's second grade class is: Was his mom a teacher in the one room schoolhouse, or were any other relatives um, teachers in the schoolhouse? Ah, well, there was. Uh, there, the, the rules were that the uh, teachers always had to be single. They couldn't be dating anyone. They couldn't be married or whatever. So there was a lot of females that were uh, in the schools. And actually, the two uh, sisters to Norm, Charlotte and uh, Palma, both taught in that same one-room schoolhouse that they went to. Uh, his, all of his family went to that school. It had been around for a long time. So Charlotte and, and Palma both taught there. Palma went on to teach at, uh, in Cedar Falls as a kindergarten teacher. And Charlotte would then, she would substitute. Uh, she was a farm wife and raised uh, kids. And then she also would sub uh, in 
the uh, school system in Cresco. Um, so Tom, was it common for, um, for boys to go to high school um, at the time and what made, what enabled um, Tom, why did his family choose to send him to high school? Well, it, it was through the, I think they, they always felt that education was important. It was the, it was the way of, of uh, improving yourself. And so when Sina, his cousin, that was his teacher came to him and said, you know, he needs to go to high school. He's got a lot of grit and determination. He could do something uh, with, with his life with that. And they felt strongly that that's, that's an important. And so they did, they made that sacrifice, but there was something else that happened that was uh, coincidental maybe, I don't know. But in 1929, when he's getting ready to go on to high school, uh, there just happened to be uh, the, the family uh, I would imagine several of the family, the Borlaug families, uh, went together and bought a tractor that uh, was a, a Fordson, invented by Henry Ford. You guys that drive, uh, your, your parents drive Ford trucks or whatever. Henry Ford, the same guy, uh, invented the uh, Fordson tra tractor and they bought a uh, tractor to work on the fields. And so because of that, Here's a tractor that could do all this work and it wouldn't get tired at the end of the day like the horses. And so Henry thought, if this, since we have this, maybe it's possible that Norm could go on. So it's very lucky that they got that tractor because otherwise he would probably have stayed on the farm farming. So another question we have, Mrs. Wilson um, asked if we have time, which we have four minutes left. So if you can make oh. it a short answer to it. Um, okay. She'd like you to tell a little bit of the story about the snort, the snowstorm. Oh, time okay. for a little bit of that. Yeah, it's in it's in one of the books written by uh, Noel Wiedmeyer, but uh, he was a five year or five or no, he was six years old, actually, when he went to first grade, there was no such thing as kindergarten back then. And we didn't have any kind of uh, forecasting of weather. And so they were at this one room schoolhouse, which is about a mile from where Norm is living. And in his sisters, well, his sisters weren't going there yet. But he, uh, he and his classmates, uh, a snowstorm came up, and so the teacher, uh, Mrs. Hal Miss Halverson, sent them home. And there was one group that uh, were the were lived over by the Protovan area, uh, and so she walked them home. And Norm's uh, group went uh, with Sina, and they had to traipse through this deep snow. They were not uh, getting picked up by a school bus, and they were going Indian style, as they called it, in a single row. And in that single row, Norm was put in the middle because he was the youngest of the boys. And this snow was deep. You can imagine a little six-year-old boy traipsing through deep, deep snow during this blizzard. And finally, he had had enough, and he just laid down in the snow and giving up. And uh, Sina came over and picked him up and slapped him across the face a couple times. Says, "Get up, get up!" Because she was worried. You know, she we, they were worried about not getting home. And so they he got up got back to the house and there was uh, his grandmother was making fresh loaves of bread and he says never had anything smelled so good in his life but the day that he almost died i bet that bread did smell good yeah. um so we're about out of time but tom can you wrap up by telling us um what can students learn from norman barlog and his life well it just shows you know i've told you very briefly about you know this is a boy that grew up just like you kids who grow up in your schools. Uh, but it was much tougher. It was a tougher existence. And, uh, you know, it was, here's a boy that grew up in the 1920s and look what he was able to do in his life. It's very inspirational. He was there to help the world. He knew that it was up to him and other scientists to do whatever they could throughout their lives to uh, better the lives of all those poorer people in all the countries that needed that food. And he just dedicated himself. And to me, that is the, that's the definition of a hero. And for you students, that means that for all of you, you are fifth graders, you think, well, what difference can you make? Well, look what he did in one lifetime. So each of you have that within yourself. And so he would say to you, and he would, he'd always, he'd love talking to kids. He'd say, make sure that you always are doing your best and, and decide what you're going to do and then go at it and give it give it your all. He says, you only have that one life to live. And so don't waste it. And so to me, his inspiration 
goes on through the generations and hopefully we'll be talking about him 100 years from now. And you students are the next generation that are going to be taking over. And so are you gonna be the next Norman Borlaug? And maybe you can fill those shoes that you saw uh, in, in the school or in the, the house that we had. Yeah, you know, we have over 20 classrooms joining us. So there's a good chance that um, that there could be some students. I know that there's some students in these classrooms that are going to make a world of difference. Um, so thank you. We're going to sign off, but thank you so much for joining us. And students, we encourage you to continue learning about Norman Borlaug. There were many more questions asked um, that we didn't have a chance to get to, but Tom and I will go back now and we'll answer those questions. So um, look for those in a little bit. And thank you so much for joining us today. Tom, thank you and the Norman Borlaug Foundation. Laura, we haven't seen you, but you're behind the camera. Thank you for being our camera lady today and um, Silos and Smokestacks partnership with this. Um, and thank you to all the, the students and teachers for joining us. Have a great, um, the rest of your Ag Week and uh, celebrating Norman Borlaug's birthday and Iowa History Month. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>